Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, and welcome to How to Quadruple E-Commerce Sales Using live, stream and so live Streaming and Social Media. My name is Colin Main. I'm the Director of Programs at the NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center. And for those of you who may not know, the NASDAQ Center is a nonprofit that's building a better path for entrepreneurs worldwide by improving inclusion, access, and knowledge in entrepreneurship. As you may have just seen in the chat, the NASDAQ Center, along with our partner Mentor Club, launched a free mentor matching platform for entrepreneurs called Mentor Makers. You can create your own advisory board to guide and inspire you with in the moment mentorship from topic experts and professionals dedicated to providing exceptional mentorship to entrepreneurs across all races, industries, and geographies. So find or become a mentor today by using that link in the chat. Mentorship matters to all entrepreneurs. Their success is dependent on it. Quick housekeeping, we're gonna open up for live Q&A at the end of the event. So please submit those questions for us in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen throughout the presentation. We'll try to get to them all. Now, none of what we do here at the center could be possible without all the amazing support from our sponsors, including NASDAQ, Lehigh University, Bank of the West, Airbnb, KPMG, Wilson Sonsini, Woodruff Sawyer, BPM, and HubSpot. We're grateful and humbled by their contributions. Now, during these still, in many ways, unique times, we're curious on how sentiment is among the entrepreneurs that we work with. So before we get started, I'm gonna launch a quick poll, just let us know how you're feeling about your business today. Are you optimistic? In survival mode, let us know. We use this data to help understand where we need to be on the wellness category for the programming that we provide for our entrepreneurs. So thank you all for voting. I'm gonna jump right into the content in a moment here. So I'm going to share those results. Looks like surviving and optimism are almost in a tie um, and a little bit of anxiousness. So hopefully our presentation today will help alleviate some of that anxiety. Uh, so without any further delay, please join me in giving a warm welcome to our special guest in the chat, Frost Lee. She's the founder and CEO of Social Chat. Frost, welcome. Hi, Colin. Thank you so Hi. much. Looking forward to this, over to you. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, um, thanks for asking the question, Colleen. I couldn't vote, but I'm definitely super optimistic uh, for the time being, and I will share why. I love um, that. Yes. Um, so this goes directly to... Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't really let me share hmm. full screen. Um, well, I think that should be quite simple to fix. We'll just call it again. Okay, great. Now it works. Amazing. So today we're going to talk about social commerce. How do we convert engagement to real revenue? Because at the end of the day, we spend all these efforts, uh, we have all the presence on all the social media or creating content on the website, not only to make users engage with us by like clicking on likes, shares, but really we want them to truly like our product, make a purchase, refer to their friends, uh, and continuously like purchasing and visiting the website. Right, so today we're going to talk about how do we do that, and as a result, uh, for its return on our investment. And this number was specifically chosen because it's from one of the case study, like when I was executing all these strategies with customers. So it's a real number out there. Hey, Frost, sorry to and, interrupt, but um, the I'm not seeing a full screen version of your slides. Your desktop might have. I'm seeing okay the same view that I saw last time. Hmm, that is very bizarre. Um, even I click on play, you didn't see the full screen one? We did not, I saw the same one that I saw the first time. Um, there we go, How boom, you know? and we landed. Okay, great. Well, technology is hard as always, especially about presentation. So let's just go off this again. So uh, really quick about uh, this that really is trying to make your numbers go to the right and go to the top as every marketing person likes to see. And a little bit just about myself. Hi, I'm Frost. Uh, these are the companies I've been working with uh, before. So you can see my entire career has been on social media and e-commerce platforms. 
especially uh, my background was in machine learning uh, to begin with. So here I will talk about how can we really use a technical angle to talk about in this like, fast opportunity of converting all your engagement and all your audience into your buyers and real revenue from there. So I think everyone feels uh, the difficulty nowadays when they are running either paid ads or really just tons of organic traffic and content on the media, which is really low conversion uh, overall, because a lot of people, they click on likes, loves, and then you were hoping, well, I got 5,000 likes. At least I should get 500 likes, right? And the result is sometimes not true. There comes for many reasons. I'll just name a few. One, it's really, really hard for your customers to go from liking your post to making a purchase. What do I mean? Uh, all these social platforms, their apps make it really hard uh, to open even a browser window. They open an in-app window that accidentally or purposely do not share uh, the same cookies or the same settings as the normal browser window. So as a result, they couldn't even log in. They forgot their password. They don't really have anything that, for example, they put in the cart. It's just not there. Two, uh, a lot of the medias especially make it really hard to make a click to happen because we have to think about what these platforms are trying to optimize for themselves. They try to optimize to keep their customers inside their own platform, right? So you really have to give users a lot of strong motivation. Why should they like especially go feed your website? Instagram, for example, make it almost impossible to link uh, from a post to your website, unless you pay for the shoppable like Instagram post. And even that, it opens any app browser. And again, why does that matter? It doesn't share the same shopping cart as when users just normally shop uh, on your website on their normal mobile browser or on their desktop. So these are a lot of the designs of the platform itself. And there are some, uh, environmental changes as well, because uh, all your mobile phones are trying to protect your privacy farther and farther, which is good. But for advertisers, it's getting harder and harder to reach to the same customers every time when you're running these ads. So that's why uh, it's definitely getting harder uh, to go through these conversions. But here's the hope. We can basically give user a really strong uh, motivation to come to your website. And then if you can make all these social interactions and content you are posting on the social media directly to your website, then you can really gain back all the convergence you used to enjoy before. So I can give you an example. If you were posting an amazing tutorial on your social already, why don't you post a preview and then let user know, hey, if you really want to learn this free lesson, register on website, you'll get this free tutorial. And then you can learn about who are interested in this kind of content. So you get a first party data. First party data means the users proactively provide their contact info to you and then you can use it freely. It's not limited by privacy laws because they explicitly grant you to be able to email them afterwards, to text them afterwards. And once they make the conversion, you'll learn what kind of customers with what kind of content help them to make the purchase decision. And furthermore, because they directly visit your website, you will be able to continuously engage them with other content. For example, they watch a tutorial, they purchase something, and you learn that on the fly, then immediately you can recommend them something similar, maybe how to maintain the product they just purchased well. So this kind of content can continuously engage your customers and make them purchase more and make them refer their friends. And the most important thing I'll emphasize again is you know exactly who actually purchased 
what content make them purchase. So you have all this data in order to continuously optimize and be able to fit in to your machine learning models. So overall, um, we can talk about like the alternatives of all this traffic as well. Because one of the interesting channels that have been uprising in the counter marketing in general is influencer marketing. Why is it rising? Uh, just like what we were talking about, uh, Facebook ads and all this advertisement get super expensive. And then for the brands, a lot of times when they go through these influencers, they get a special uh, type of audience. It would otherwise hard to reach for them at the same cost. Two is content marketing. It's content, right? These influencers are really, really good at making content. So you fundamentally not only pay for the traffic, but you are also paying for really high quality content and they know their audience very well. So they can create the content specifically for their audience that will really comfort for you with their knowledge. And three, uh, really it's the brand trust as well. So if you hire someone who's already well trusted in that industry. So for example, we always see all the advertisement back in the day on TV, people always hire a dentist uh, to sell any like teeth whitening products. They are influencers to a degree, right? So if you were selling some teeth whitening products online, you may also want to hire a dentist to review your product, to tell your customers how important it is to clean your teeth in the right way, to use your product in a certain style. As a result, they can really see the impact of their teeth. And ideally, they can even share the results with you. So you can use that uh, as the future influencer marketing, right? Because your successful customers basically become a mini influencer to you as well that is trusted by other customers. So for all these benefits, uh, you can see like almost every year, it grows like 20 to 30% uh, year by year. And if you were ask me to predict, I think it will become even higher growth uh, from now on just because a lot of the traditional marketing channels uh, are having this fatigue right now and users are really seeking something more new and more interesting to them. And another trend that is happening is users are really into interactive and visual experiences. If we think back even five years ago, users are pretty okay with text descriptions or even just like text reviews. But as more and more brands go online, users can be satisfied. They want to see not only the photos of the products, they want to see a video of the products so they can go 360 degrees to see what it really is. They want to be interactive. They want to be able to ask questions directly, just like how we are doing right now, right? When we are telling a content, they want to learn more. Like for example, in this photo, they want to learn more about, okay, so you are showing me this color of the lipstick. Can you put on your lip and show us how it would really look like? Um, is it moisturizing? How should I use it pairing with other colors, right? So there are a lot of questions users in their mind and they would like to be answered right there to be able to make a purchase decision. And furthermore, it's not really one user, right? Because every user engagement is really making the entire experience even more authentic. So they know, okay, these are real users. They're asking a similar question as me. So all the other users are also consuming the same information. And this community feeling also gets people more engaged and really trusting the content more. And Basically, we call it social proof in marketing because you see how other people are reacting to it. And sometimes you even see other users answering that question um, that people ask, oh, 
So I've been trying to use this air purifier in my room, but it's really loud. And sometimes you just see another person answer the question directly there saying, oh, you just have to turn it to the eco mode at night and then you will just be fine, right? So these other uh, community marketing effectiveness really boost the conversion and the trust as well. So here, uh, I want to mention one of the leading brands who has just been so good at marketing overall. Uh, I would like all of you to guess uh, how much money do they spend on influencer marketing, especially in the video format alone every year? Oh, I wish I can do a pour. Uh, <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll let you think about it for a minute. And I'll tell you how much it is. They actually spend $3.1 billion annually on this alone. Why? Because it's effective. Because it's really giving them, again, not only the performance on the spot, but I keep saying about the trust, about the social proof, about the community. So all this return on investment is not only on the moment, it's really a lifetime value lifting, which is why this is amazing. And they, as the leading brand in marketing, have been employing this strategy so strongly and so dedicatedly. So we are talking about influence, right? What does influence mean? Uh, I would like to just... Um, go really quick about a lot of people when they talk about influence, they are thinking about followers, they are thinking about how many likes, how many engagement. But as e-commerce or as any online service, as founders, we have to think about influence as conversion, right? Return on investment, the return is the right revenue for you. So in order to know how much influence these marketing campaigns are having for you, you need to see the real number, right? That's why it has to be measurable. To make this marketing strategy scalable, it has to be repeatable. It cannot be one-time wonder, and then it cannot be repeated again ever. Then that's not a really marketing strategy. We have to have the right timing. So we basically reach out to users at the right time that are ready to make the purchase. And uh, I keep emphasizing how important it is to put it directly on your site, just so it's easier for your users to experience your branding experience, make a purchase right there. And most importantly, you have all the information to make it measurable and to know the right timing and make this repeatable. So these all four things really help each other together. And we'll go one by one. Key one, we have to make it measurable, right? We got to have a KPI and be able to measure if it really reaches the KPI out there. So these are the KPIs uh, when the company is doing an online survey. What do people care when they are doing all this content marketing? So we'll just talk about the first three items. Quality of content. This is very important, but how do we measure it, right? Like you watch the content, I watch the content, everyone can agree on different type of content, what is of higher quality. So even though it's extremely important, it's really, really hard to measure consistently and it's really hard to optimize overall, right? To target audience which is super important. And how do we measure the effectiveness of target audience? We have to have a quantitative way of doing so. Third, engage rate, uh, engagement rate. So again, what kind of engagement? Engagement can be views, it can be likes, it can be shares, it can be a direct purchase. Issue engagement means different level of commitment from the customer. And of course, they should be weighted differently, right? A like on your social post and an A to car event on your website. The latter should be weighing 10 times higher than the former, naturally. So here's my suggestion on the bottom left side of easy to measure and very quantitative 
So for example, quality, quality of content, what it should be translated to. It should be translated into click-through rate, right? If the quality is good, people would take the action after consuming the content. We should see like purchase conversion rate because people get really, really good information. Therefore they are convinced. We should also be able to see total transaction processed per campaign because this campaign was able to drive a lot of purchases, right? And then ideally you are so high quality users end up signing an account and therefore you can make sure you can have repeating purchases. So by having this very quantitative, easy to measure numbers, that's how you can make sure when you're optimizing, you really reach your goal because otherwise, it's just getting really, really hard to compare apples to apples when we talk about quality of the content or engagement rate, because it's like such different meaning out there. The second thing is, how do we know what is a good return on investment? And uh, I find out a lot of the influencer or content marketing campaigns, I myself have experienced before, they quote you a really, really high number because they have a lot of followers or they say, oh, the, stu the studio has such good equipment and you hire a really good director to create the content for you. But that doesn't really mean, again, the quality of the video production doesn't really mean that's what exactly your customers are looking for. So ideally for any of these campaigns, you want to go with a revenue sharing model. If the influencer or the content generator know their audience, they should be able to comfort all these audience for you and they should feel safe to get a revenue sharing, say 20% as of any affiliate programs, rather than charge you $10,000 upfront for a single post. And also it gives them the right incentive to really drive the traffic and purchases on your website instead of getting more traffic onto their own account, more engagement on their own post while spending your marketing budget. Some of the bigger influencers are not willing to take this kind of model and you can try to do it in a hybrid way with a base pay and plus the revenue sharing model. Basically the more revenue sharing in the equation, usually the more successful the campaign become. Another interesting part of who to hire is you don't really need like a really big name influencers a lot of your loyal users are the best in terms of the roi they literally are fans of you they sound so authentic other customers can see that are professionals they know they are sharing their true experiences and they ask for nothing uh they usually just feel happy to be there with you or just give them a free product or even a discount they'll be there for you and this user-generated content, I would call UGC, is really uh, the king of content marketing overall. And adding a little bit to that, not only this amazing ROI is super scalable because you have a lot of users who love you versus you have to search up and down for the right influencers uh, to do the content with you. So after making sure uh, it is measurable, what is a good time to run these campaigns? The more interactive the campaigns are, the more important the timing is, right? When we send an email, users may actually open the email after three days and they can be equally engaged. But if you were doing a live session, like what we're doing right now, it's all about timing. If I started at 11.30 PM, then no one will be here. So what is a good time for you to do the campaigns? Industry-wide, the best time for a live shopping session is noon or right after work. Why? Because people are bored when they're eating lunch, especially when they're working from home. They don't have coworkers to eat lunch with them. And also right after work, they feel, well, I can take some time off and check out stuff. But what is most important to you specifically is 
do it when your users shop usually. So if your users always shop at 3 p.m. because the specifics of your product, do it then. Don't try to change their behavior. So for example, um, one of the famous example was all these grocery shopping apps. Uh, instead of sending out email at 10 a.m., which is a golden standard for a lot of the marketing folks, they usually send out an email at 2 or 3 p.m. because that's the time when you feel kind of, hmm, I should start preparing for dinner. And then that's how they get you when you are thinking about it and you actually order from them. Also during the year, there are certain times that are specifically really good uh, that users are thinking about, well, I can kind of be a little bit indulgent about my spending. So I list a few very important days, but the best day so far I've ever experienced is always a payday. Um, people really do spend money when they just get a paycheck. Duh. Um, it is way more effective than I have ever anticipated. Even just one day difference, they really make their shopping behavior from there. So after we find a good timing and we make the KPI measurable and what our goal is, how do we make it repeatable? So we can continuously scale this channel overall. We really need to make users like trust the brand and make them buy and stay. What does that mean? So here I'm just giving an example that when users are asking you questions right there on the right-hand side, at the time, the brand doesn't even sell sunscreen. So there's no benefits for the brand to recommend like a sunscreen to another brand or you should do it. But instead, uh, they were really truly to their brand value. They said, well, sunscreen is the most important item without using it. Uh, all the other products are not going to be effective. So by saying that, they actually gain the user's trust because these users really like care about ingredients and their regimen. And as a result, the users like purchase way more after that conversation. And again, we already talked about the social proof. Do you want your community to talk with each other? So they actually are the best sellers for you. And that's how it is repeatable because you can try to create as many good brand content as possible, but there will always be different perspectives and different kind of customers who are coming there and how to comfort them. It's really, they would find out someone who just like them, uh, who's also considering or already an existing loyal customer to you. And they learn from the customer, they like the experience and that's how they make a purchase from there. So really your community is not only your power users can be your mini influencer, just regular users who are participating in your events would comfort new users and users who are still hesitating for sure. And uh, last but not least, actually the most important thing to make things repeatable is don't give discounts for no reason because it's not really a campaign. Um, I'll give a really simple scenario. I took this screenshot at the random website. Almost every single website you go now, you'll see something like this. What does the effect, uh, what does that affect us? When you just visit the site within the first five seconds, it pops out this, you barely know what this website is, right? Because it's only for the first order. So you are literally a new customer. As a new customer, how do you know about your product at all? You don't know anything. And they just ask you for email already. Like, how can you be convinced by this campaign? So as a result, it's more like cannibalization for your other campaigns that end up convincing the customer to purchase. They come back to the site with an incognito window or just open a new tab and they find out this and then sign up the email to get this coupon. And now you're like, well, Frost, that's kind of okay, right? Because even after they were convinced otherwise, uh, I still got their email and their consent show uh, for us to send marketing email afterwards. So still a win-win. Well, not really. Because um, after this huge trend of people doing this, I heard a lot of the questions from brands asking me, 
Hey, Frost. Uh, we found a lot of one and done users. What does one and done mean? One and done means the user only purchased once and then you never come back again. Uh, we wonder what happened. And the reason is simple. If I just use a new email and I get 20% off, why would I use my old account in any way? I'm more like punished for being a loyal customer rather than being rewarded. We should only reward people when they are loyal, not like only giving discount to new users. So as a result, tons of people, they just keep registering with new email. It's super easy. You can do frost plus one, two, three at gmail.com and plus one, two, four at gmail.com. You'll be considered as two different emails and you get all these discount codes and you basically just give 20% of your margin to all your customers. You might as well just change your, your price to be lower to everyone. Uh, so you actually increase your comfort rate right there rather than doing all these efforts because they're not going to necessarily even use those email uh, to receive marketing, right? They can do plus spend one, plus spend two. And for any of the spend, it goes directly to the spend inbox. So if you have ever doubt why your users are not repeating, Look at your email list a little bit. You'll find out a lot of them actually do this kind of stuff already. And fourth, uh, and really most important, and that's actually how we make it possible to be measurable. We make it more repeatable. We make it timely is you should do it on your website because that's how you have the really focal view of how the performance really is and who are the people really coming and are they repeating customers? Are they real new customers? Like what's going on, right? So I'll give you an example. Again, I just randomly found this post on the internet. I didn't mean anything to this special influencer. This is a beautiful photo. But let's just look at this photo for a little bit. Okay, so this person uh, is doing PR for, I believe five brands at once or maybe one of the brand and she added other things out there. So it looks a little bit less of like um, a campaign. I know it's a campaign because in the hashtag it says PR, uh, which is basically you have to say it's PR when you are uh, doing paid campaigns in general. Okay, so how do I measure the success of this? If I were the brand who paid this particular person? Likely you'll hear from the agency telling you, hey, Frost, I got 297 likes. Uh, is this likes about my particular product or is it about other products? How many people actually purchased it? Uh, who actually visit my website from this pretty post? Uh, can I actually run a retargeting ads for these 297 likes? The answer to all these questions are no. So I spent all these efforts finding this influencer who produced amazing photo, what's the ROI? I really don't know, right? Unless you hire, I mean, there are outliers. If you hire Kim Kardashian, who just generated like 5 million website visits for you within an hour, yes, you know that is her. I personally have done this before. I can tell you, if you do an outlier person, that happens. But if you are already hiring Kim Kardashian, you don't have to listen to this talk. You're already successful. <laughs> out there um yeah so make it like if you are really giving a high quality content make users log in to view it uh make users sign up make users like say who they are so they can participate in a conversation so you know who they are you know if they are satisfied you know who to follow up you know if this campaign is successful at all right does this influencer bring you real customers does these influencers bring you real purchases? And for this influencer herself, she also needs to know, does this campaign help her branding as well as making money for her? So this really is a win-win situation at the end. And also I just talked about another important thing is you have to make it super easy for users to shop. Make the shopping cart right there if you're already doing this, make it on your site. If you make it like seven steps away for the users to buy something, they would just not do it. Um, like 
I there are just too many examples. I don't even know where to start. Like for example, you can have a campaign. Um, they say Instagram. So the user click on the link on your profile and goes to your website and search for that specific product you mentioned in the live or like the video or the content you have. And then they find out about it. They add that to the cart and oh shoot, it doesn't reconnect with their account or card because in in app browser. So they have to click on a special settings there to open the page on a normal Safari browser on their iPhone or a Chrome browser on their Android. And then and then go from there to sign in and to check out. If you count that, it's literally like seven steps. Anything more than three steps, users are not interested unless they are dying for that product. If already dying for the product, that will be your, your loyal users. And really, they are not where you can optimize the most for the conversion and your real ROI. So we have already talked about this. If we really measure everything, the influence with revenue, making sure every single dollar sign you spend is measurable, make sure all the campaigns and strategies are repeatable. So you don't have to continuously like re-strategize uh, once in a while. It's fine, but you don't want to be like, okay, every single campaign it ends, I have to like redo everything again. It's just like not going to be time efficient for you. Find the right timing, make it directly on your website so you know who they are, and most importantly, users can shop easily, then I think the future is pretty bright because you find out a channel not only give you really good quality content, build user trust, and also it's just going to be higher ROI if you do all of this together out there. So that's uh, my talk today, and let's keep in touch. Uh, that's my Twitter handle. One thing I'm really proud of because like I said, uh, this is my biggest gift uh, when I was working on Twitter uh, early on. And this is my email and, or you can come to our website uh, that I specifically designed for this talk and I learn more about this. Yeah, so thanks everyone. Uh, yeah, Colleen, I think now we are ready for the Q and A. Awesome. Well, if you want to stop sharing your screen, we can just have a conversation around this. Before we jump into Q&A, one last poll from my end that helps us understand what you all are looking to learn over the next couple months. So just let us know what area. Obviously, this talk is about marketing, so I'm not going to be surprised if marketing continues to be the leader here. But just let us know if it's finance, sales, scaling, pivoting, team, or survival. Um, thank you so much. We're going to jump into Q&A, and if you haven't dropped your question for Frost yet into the Q&A box, do so. We'll try to get to them all. Well, no surprise there. Marketing is the leader, but sales, finance, and scale, all there too. So we will definitely get to work on those. Um, so Frost, first of all, great presentation. I think you went through under the, you went under the hood in a lot of ways that a lot of marketers don't. So thank you so much for sharing that. Um, some questions. Are there platforms that you like for social selling and for organizing influencer marketing sales? Well, Colleen, um, I, I try to be like super neutral about my own product, but with this question, I have to say, um, so you should really visit um, the landing page I have and check out our product. Uh, and if you were to must use a social platform and you don't want to use the product on your site, which I really think you should, um, I think among all the different platforms, I would say at least try, I know you may have the biggest audience on Instagram, but that one really has the lowest conversion just because Facebook really, really tried to make it super, super difficult. So wow. I, I saw all the other, even Twitch has higher conversion than Instagram. So that's all I try to say. But everyone, when they think about influencers, they always go higher on Instagram first. And when they see the post, they just sell like 5,000 likes. And it's a real life story. I'm not going to uh, drop the name of the brand who talked to me about this. And then they don't see any purchases. So mm. what does that 5,000 likes even mean? It's even on the influencer's post, right? You want the 5,000 likes if really you need that on your own post. And I think at least that is your thing. Uh, that's yeah. what matters. 
And yeah. yeah, as you mentioned, likes don't necessarily drive, don't mean sales, uh, not all the time. Um, so another question here, how do you find influencers to hire? They don't follow any of them and I know they're popular and don't, but don't see the value in people telling me what to like. Um, so any advice there? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think really it's better to find a lot of micro influencers and they are not that expensive to hire. So you can learn about what kind of audience are actually good audience for you for this kind of content. And then you can quickly optimize, right? Say you choose 10 influencers, each of them have like 200,000 followers. They will not charge that much. A lot of them will even be free and only take revenue sharing model. And you'll find some of them sell $100,000 for you within like a post or like 30 minutes live and someone will sell only $500 for you, right? And then, so quickly you identify, oh, this person works so well, why? Oh, because this person is targeting this group of folks and this person is targeting a different kind of audiences. So it also helps you to learn what kind of content and what kind of target audience that will work best for you with someone already has an existing audience and existing type of content. So it's a really cheap way for not only influencer marketing, but also to test out and identify your marketing message overall. Yeah. yeah. Um, keep these questions coming in. They're all great. Um, somebody said, please clarify the shopping cart example. Um, not very clear as to what happens and how to not make it happen. Thank you. Yeah. So um, the shopping cart example is you have to do some type of integration. It's either like, for example, the example I use is like myself for a screenshot. If you really want to build on your own, you should just embed this and with a shopping cart right next to the content. Because really, uh, just imagine if you walk into a store and if the, the staff tell you, okay, Frost, in order to check out, you have to walk like three floors up to the top floor and then you can buy this piece of clothes. Like, seriously, I would just give up that clothes, you know, <laughs> unless I really, really, really need at the moment. So don't make that to users. Like, that's why the checkout is always, always right next to the most popular sales station, even in a physical store, because people are just lazy. Or maybe, maybe you are not, but like, as shoppers, we are really lazy. We just want to make it easy and we buy, right? If we, you give me three more hours to consider, then I may find other options. I may no longer be interested. So either use some solution I put there uh, in a link. Um, I promise, Cory, I'm not, I'm not going to <laughs> like do promotion of my software too much or if you to build yourself, really think about the example of walking three floors up. Mm. You don't want your users to do that. Make it, make it forward. Uh, yeah. Like um. And then you talked a little bit about micro influencers, but uh, the, another question came in right after you were talking about it. So like, how do you even just like identify? Is there like a list of influencers, micro influencers somewhere? Like, how do you even identify them? Oh, there's a super, uh, I should say super easy way. Uh, it's a way I like to do myself is what is your brand attached to? So usually when you do posts, you have all these hashtags, right? That's what you, as a founder, believe what your brand is associated with as your brand statement. Mm -hmm. Click on those hashtags. Who are the ones with the most engagement and the most loves and the best content that you like? Do that. So it's number one, scalable. Number two, at the, at the end of the day, they are surfacing your brand, right? So really, they have to identify with your brand to start and not the other way around. I love that. Yeah. Um, what are your thoughts about selling through TikTok? Yeah. So actually recently, a lot of people asked me about this because TikTok just announced they are going to scale down their e-commerce efforts in the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if all of you read about the news. Um, if you haven't, uh, it's everywhere around the internet and I would recommend you reading a little bit about it. And why? The reason, is, no, the reason TikTok is very successful in China is because 
they have all these like Taobao and WeChat integration. So users still have the checkout center right next to them, mm. right? Because everyone uses WeChat Pay. In the United States, it's not the case. So when Apple and Google say, well, we're not going to like make it easy for you to retarget people, it's not. So like all these uh, differences make it just like not working because again, the checkout center and to know who the user are is three flows away. And that's why it is harder. So I really think you can still use TikTok to get a lot of traffic, but you really want the conversion. You want the content to be on your site just simply because of the, the difficulty in terms of like knowing who the users are and knowing what is the real conversion, the real target audience. And mm-hmm. we just cannot be really copy exactly what happens in China because we don't have a WeChat here. You know, Facebook tried to be WeChat and it failed because the faith simply just wouldn't allow it. So it's just like, it's not going to happen, unfortunately. Unfortunately, I guess. I don't know which way you would think yeah. that way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's all great. Okay. And then somebody asked, is social chat only for Shopify or also integrates with others like WordPress? Uh, it's not WordPress. It's called uh, WooCommerce, which is the e-commerce solution for WordPress. So I will add all the information onto that very landing page so it doesn't become a sales session uh, yeah. for me. And of course, I have all these uh, websites I already integrated us, all the examples I, I screenshotted or like active uh, customers of us. So right. I will add it to the landing page so you can see all these, the case studies and all the websites yeah. out there. Awesome. All right, we got another question here um, in the email marketing world. Uh, major challenges surrounding email open rates. Any quick insights on the subject? Yeah, absolutely. So I think uh, there are a few uh, different changes recently. Uh, so after iOS 15, Apple rolled out a change that for all the mail app on iPhone, they no longer allow the open tracking with a pixel. Uh, that's one. Uh, the worst of it is Apple also wrote out this feature. I'm pretty sure if you use iPhone, you already know this. When you sign up on websites, it says, do you want to hide your email or not? And when you choose to hide your email, Apple creates a one-time email for that and they forward the email to your account. Mm-hmm. So not only you don't know what is a real email for customer identification, but also you don't know if they open or not. And these users are usually the highest LTV user because they are the newest iPhone customers. So there is a way that we can uh, alleviate that because when Apple doesn't allow you, uh, there's like very limited things you can do uh, from there. Uh, But one thing uh, usually you do is for two things. One is, when you are sending out emails, uh, make sure if any of the emails are of the Apple mask email, if they are, remove them from the metrics. It's not that many of them. It's about like three to 5% overall. Don't let it pollute your data overall. Two is when you are calculating the open rate, separate the iOS 15 versus the rest because a lot of those are under counting right now. And third, really what matters most is not equal open rate, is email click through rate. So whenever people ask me about this, I was like, what matters is if the click or not anyways. So uh, make your click uh, like call to action as high as possible and make it like very promo- um, like basically like very easy to see, make it like very attractive. Uh, like I feel it really changes the game before like people were like, oh, it's just like feature only is like doing feel through attribution. But now we really need to move to more uh, click-through attribution. Last but not least, if you have a lot of engineers, Gmail has this special SDK you can <laughs> integrate with so people can do actions inside Gmail. And then when they perform those actions, you will get the feedback loop. So even if they hide the open pixel and they don't open the link to go to your site, you'll know they have did something done something with your email. But again, uh, that's a way heavier 
lifting yeah. uh, you have to do there. I did that before. You definitely need a full-time engineer like working on this. And it's harder for Clovio or any of these platforms to offer that because all these interactions are so personalized that you have to create yourself uh, mm-hmm. out there. So check out Pinterest email. Pinterest does that integration very well. I really enjoy that. And you can see how they do that. Cool. Yeah. Um, let's see, what was your most valuable lesson in transitioning sales from beginner to wide market sales? Uh, I'm not sure if I... Um, yeah, I guess what uh, I'm interpreting in Dominique, forgive me if I'm butchering this question, but I believe it's, um, how did you, what, what did you learn along from just focusing on a single niche market to, um, like on your initial go-to-market ICP to like scaling out the market distribution? Like what's the, what's your lesson in scaling beyond the first market? Um, I think the... I've done this multiple times. Um, basically, one thing you really need to ensure is you are really testing all this and you give everything a fair chance. Because a lot of times we just don't know and we cannot project ourselves as our users. So I used to, I always give exactly the same example. So whilst I wish we found out one of the really, really amazing uh, segment of customers are people in the Midwest and all really love to buy reads. So how do we know that? Because we really iterate through all different content and different kind of uh, audiences. Like I just said, right? Try to hire many, many micro-influencers, try all different content and see which one rules. If you ask me, I have never thought about saving rings in Midwest. Like I went to school in Midwest. I never thought about it. But it was doing so crazily well. We ate rings into our like, app store like apple like feature keywords because it was so good so really try to make it measurable and taste widely because you never know what really is out there for you to expand to the opportunity might be bigger than you thought wow yeah solid advice testing is key um another question Ooh, and sorry but or uh i Let's let's just roll through it. I feel like we're throwing money down a Facebook advertising hole. <laughs> Apologies for that. This is great company content for helping us think about better alternatives. Thank you. Oh, so that I guess. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, let's see. Do you have a framework for testing uh, posting against an audience or positioning against an audience? Uh, way to organize them. So uh, I'll. I'll say like you can think about everything as a there are two ways to think about it. you can think about this is your core audience right every audience is kind of on the map that is like some of them are closer some of them are farther away but when you're trying different audience try to taste it for different types they have to be like different enough so the tasting actually makes sense what I found out is sometimes people are just because they're a gut feeling we're all biased I'm biased too we taste like five once and just like exactly the same thing here, right? Now, we test five, we should be like one here, one here, one here, one here, one here, right? So we know which one actually works the best. So I feel uh, the short answer is make them different enough and know in your mind why you are tasting, right? Are you tasting different age groups? Are you tasting different genders? Are you tasting different geometry? Are you tasting different categories? Once you have that, you'll also be more aware. Am I tasting just like against exactly the same thing or like two similar things? Um, and so you are able to really taste it with uh, full confidence. Great. Um, let's see, somebody has a uh, true or false question. You have to use a media agency who is a partner of Facebook to really get your ads money worth. True or false? Well, I I feel like they have to pitch you, right? So they have to offer you value. I feel the true or false really depends on the agency's quality, to be honest with you, because it's really the agency's marketing ability versus your marketing team's marketing ability, mm. right? Um, but I would like to say one thing. I personally almost never use Facebook 
advertise in my agency because I had a luxury of having a bigger team and every company I was advising or working with, I have a pretty big team internally. As a founder, your time is so precious. So I feel I I feel you have to think a little bit about the ROI is not only on the ass money, but on your personal time. And when you factor that in and then you decide, is it really worth your time every week for like 20 hours running Facebook ads? Because to do it well, you do have to spend a lot of time on doing it. Uh, can you hire someone internally who's as good and as senior as you can find someone in the agency? Right. If you can do everything just equally well, in-house is always better. Why? Because I've stuck in your company. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they care more. They want to, and they stay long term, right? But if you don't have that, the agency is really not a bad choice to save your time when you go to market. Mm. Yeah, I hope that answers the question. That definitely does. Yeah. It's great, and what a way to end the session. We could spend so much time, more time with you, Frost. But what's one takeaway that if somebody were to dial into the last two minutes of this, that you want everybody to take away today? Yeah, uh, I just feel it's so, so, so important uh, to make two things happen. One is make everything measurable. Like if you make everything measurable, then you don't have to ask a question like, oh, is agency better, is in-house better? Because you can just taste, you see the numbers. You don't have to ask like, which influencer is the best to hire? You see the numbers and you know what happens, right? Result driven, data driven, measurable. Two is make your users do no work to buy your things. Like I found some companies like, I know the product is amazing, but don't make your users work because we don't work when we buy things, right? <laughs> like, don't make them work. Make it as easy as possible. Make it as consistent as possible. So when it's on your site, just like, okay, it's always this layout on the site on this page and simple and easy out there. Don't make them climb three floors, <laughs> make it out there. So I guess that's my takeaway from all my career, learning about how to market to customers. And when we do that, everything amazing just start happening automatically. (laughs) And that's why I stay optimistic to answer Cody's very first question about that. Yeah. I love that. And Frost, there's been so much awesome information shared during this. Everyone saying thank you very much. So Appreciate you coming, joining us today and sharing your wisdom with our community on behalf of everyone on our team in attendance. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. For those of you still on, um, we have some great webinars coming up up in the next couple of weeks and months. So check out the link that we just dropped in the chat. Also, if you want to give us feedback on what you'd like to see in the future, please fill out that link as well. But we appreciate you all joining us today. Hopefully this is of value and we look forward to welcoming you all back online soon. Have a good one, everyone. Yes, the YouTube will be available on YouTube or this will be available on YouTube. Thanks again, everyone.